So, dear friends, uh, welcome to this afternoon's plenary session. Uh, my name is Jan Rockström. I'm a professor in global sustainability at Stockholm University, and um, I'm uh, honored to be the moderator of this session. I'm particularly honored because I have the privilege to welcome my absolute favorite glaciologist. And I just learned from um, Professor Dorte Daljans that I'm not alone to think that you're the favorite because uh, uh, this week, Thomson Reuters gave the very eloquent and, and important information that uh, Professor Dorte Dahl Jensen is, is now the most cited uh, glaciologist in the geosciences this week. So clearly, we have the enormous privilege to have uh, one of the world's most renowned scientists in glaciology on stage today. Um, Dorte Dahl Jensen, apart from being a professor of ice physics at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen University, is a glaciologist who heads the Copenhagen University Center for Ice and Climate. Um, you've been managing the fantastic research of the North Greenland Emian Ice Drilling, the NEEM project. You'll be talking partly about this and the eminent paper that came out recently about the Greenland Ice Resilience, which was part of the Danish International Polar Year's Ice Core Drilling Program on Greenland. You coordinate also the EU FP7 Past for Future project, holding also an ERC advanced grant, and being one of the lead authors in the AMAP SWEPA, the Arctic Council's program on snow, water, ice, and permafrost in the Arctic, which is one of the key contributions in the science policy interface. Um, Professor Dahl Jensen holds a PhD in geophysics from the University of Copenhagen, is awarded with the Berlinski Foundation Award of Honor in January 2013, a member of the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences, and sitting on several key committees that bridge science and policy in the area of ice, climate, and glaciology in general. So it's absolutely fantastic to um, have the honor to listen to a talk given by you, Dorte, on the Greenland Ice Sheet, a major contributor to sea, le sea level rise in the past and in the future. With that, um, please, Dorte, this stage is yours for another 45 minutes, followed by a discussion, and we'll open the floor afterwards. So please, Dorte, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome here to my show. I'm going to try to take you to the world of ice and climate. But before I go there, I would like to say, I would like to thank you. Because if it was not for the European science, for the ERCs, or for the Danish National Research Foundation, we would never have been able to do these ice core projects in Greenland. So it's very important for me to thank you before I start this talk. See if I can get it to work. Okay, so when you look at ice, I would like you to think about um, either you have big ice sheets on the continents, or you have the, the ice melted in the ocean, which gives changing sea level. I think it's important to realize that uh, the, ice, the sea level changes with the volume of ice as it changes from being on the land and going into the ocean. As an example, if you go back 20,000 years to the last glacial maximum, um, we observed that there were big ice sheets covering Scandinavia, and there was also a big ice sheet covering North America. And at that time, the sea level was 130 meters lower than it is today. If you turned the world and looked at Antarctica, it's different in the south, because Antarctica is an isolated con continent with water around. So the, the Antarctic ice sheet cannot build up as much, so by far the biggest bodies of ice during the glacial time was on the North Hemisphere. And that's one of the tricks why the Arctic is changing so much, because the, the terrestrial areas are lying towards the north. If we go to a recent time, we are facing sea level rises of the order of one meter during the next 100 years. On this scale here, see if I can find the right button here, you can barely see one meter. So you can see that the changes we are talking about are still very small compared to the changing sea levels on a glacial to interglacial time scale. So I've put a movie here um, from the NASA page on how the, the temperatures have changed globally in the time of observation. 
And I want you to note that the global temperature change is not really relevant, that the changes are very regional. You see that you have warming and cooling different places, but as the years goes towards present, it's also pretty clear that it's becoming very orange and very warm in the Arctic. So the Arctic is simply warming much more than the global mean value. And you can also see that if you look at the... Whoops, that was the wrong one here. See if we can come back. Yeah. If we look at the curve here, which is the temperatures at the high uh, north latitudes, that the, the increase of temperature is much more than the global value and much more than what you find around the equator or at the South Pole. So it's simply happening more in the north. And in that way, we also expect to see bigger changes of the Greenland ice sheet because it's warming. Very simple. So now lo let's go to Greenland and see what we are observing right now. 50% of the loss of mass we have from the Greenland ice sheet is coming from ice streaming out of the ice streams and calving out as icebergs into the ocean. Ice discharge, as it's called. You can see a, a picture here of the Jakobshavn ice stream, which is the fastest flowing glacier in the world. After 2002, it simply doubled its velocity from 7 kilometers per year to 15 kilometers per year. And of course, the amount of icebergs that flow out will double as well. So it's very changeable, and uh, it can change the amount of ice discharged to the ocean by the changing velocities. Here's a picture, a little movie, of the big ice uh, blocks breaking off the edge of the Jakobshavn ice stream. And besides from, from uh, um, speeding up, it's also um, the front of the ice stream has moved back more than 20 kilometers and is standing on the grounding line at present. So uh, there's a lot of change there, and many poli political uh, leaders go to Greenland to observe the change because this is a place where it's very clear to see that things are changing. Now, if we try to look at the other half of the mass loss. Of course, it's the melt along the margins of the ice stream. 50% of the mass loss comes here. And it's a little more predictable because we know how much energy is needed to melt ice. So of course, uh, if it gets warmer, we can calculate how more extra energy we have. And in that way, we can follow it much easier than the ice discharge. So we can sum it all up. And the way we normally express it is in gigatons of mass loss per year. So every year it snows on the Greenland ice sheet accumulation. So we, we gain mass and we lose mass by melt and by ice streams. And if we add the numbers, we can see that Greenland is losing 240 gigatons per year, which can be translated to a global mean sea level rise of 0 0.7 millimeters per year. Just to elaborate a little more on this, I can show you some of the very, very valuable data we have. Satellite data are becoming more and more important in our research field because the ice sheets are so big and vast, it's really difficult to go out and make measurements everywhere, but the satellites do it for us. So, of course, they give us a knowledge we haven't had before. The GRACE satellite is a satellite that's a joint German-American program. And in, it's very basic, actually. It's two satellites that orbit the Earth, and they measure the position of each other. So when there's a, a change of the gravitational force from Earth, their positions change. So when the Greenland ice sheet loses mass, the gravitational attraction from the Greenland ice sheet reduces. So that's what the satellites measure, a very physical thing. So you can see it came up in 2003, and you can see that in the summer months, the Greenland ice sheet gains mass, and then it, in the winter, it gains mass. In the summer, it loses mass. So you can see the annual cycles here, but you can also see there's a strong acceleration in the mass loss. If you try to express that, you can say that we have the 0 0.7 millimeters per year of mass loss at present, but it's increasing with 9% every year. So if you took a loan and you had a mortgage of 9%, it would be a really bad deal these days. So you can, in that way, you can understand how fast it's actually accelerating the mass loss from the green and ice sheet. 
So now I'm going to go in on the center of the ice sheet, go to my research field, the big Greenland ice sheet, the ice core drilling. You might wonder, why do you want to look at ice cores, look back into the past, if you want to understand what's happening with the climate? Well, I always say that I feel like a wise man. I can go back, I can drill the ice cores, and I can see how the climate has been back in time. I can measure it, I don't have to guess what's happening in the future, but I can look what really happened in the past, and we can use these data to calibrate our understanding of what will happen into our future. We have drilled a few ice cores on the Greenland ice sheet, and I'm going to tell you about the results from the NAME ice core, and also use some results from the North Grip ice core too. So let's go into the ice sheet, and you, I'd like to introduce you to my world. When we come to the big, uh, vast, white ice sheet, there's nothing. So the first thing we have to do is to build a camp. And we have built this big uh, dome, as we call it, with a frame and uh, panels on it, and this is our main building on the ice. The project is international. It started during the international polar years, and we have 14 nations uh, participating in the project. When the camp is built, it looks like this. It's really beautiful, and uh, most people live in small tents on the surface, so we use the big dome and, uh, as our kitchen, our living room, our office, and control power tower for the airplanes. When we look at uh, the, the project of NAME, um, we have had uh, 12,520 man days at NAME. 50% of them have been young scientists from the 14 nations, so in that way it's been a really efficient summer school for our young students to collaborate internationally. 35% have been female, 65% male, which is actually a quite good statistics for, for, for research in geoscience. The science itself happens under the surface. Um, we build these big uh, snow trenches here with a snow blower and put wooden roofs on the surface here. And this is where we drill our ice cores and where we do the first research on the ice cores in our international team in the field. So here's a picture from the drill trench. The drill is here, it's hanging here, it's 13 meters long, half is over the, the floor, half is below the floor, and I've tried to make a schematic of the drill here. It's hanging in a cable, um, and then there's electronics and motors, but the bottom part is two hollow tubes, and the, the, the inner tube has this drill head um, at the bottom. So what we do is very simple. We lower the tool down in the liquid-filled hole, and when it stands at the bottom, we simply screw it down in the ice until we have three and a half meters of ice core inside the drill. We pull back in our cable, and these three bronze uh, core dogs, they grab the core and hold the core, and we break the ice at that point. We get the ice core up to the surface, where we can see a perfect three and a half meter ice core here with a diameter of 10 centimeters. Most of the cores come up like this, and they are moved into our science trench where we measure the first parameters on the ice core. I've made a little movie for you here where you can see our scientists work in the science trench. You can see it's a busy life. Everyone is working at the different benches doing different things. So first we cut the ice core here in, in slabs we can use in the different measurements. And then we measure some undestructive measurements here, electric conductivity and line scan in this table here. After that, we take the ice core over on the other table here, where we pack the ice core and cut a lot of samples that are sent around to the 50 labs that are involved in the investigations of the core. I think it's a really funny movie, because you can see that most people do the measurement alone, but every time they have to move a core, there have to be two people, one in each end of the core. So in that way, it's an enormous international teamwork we have in the field. So that was kind of the funny story, the pictures from the field. So now I'll, I'll have some slides that tell you more about the science. I think one of the absolutely most important things we can observe in the ice cores is the look at the greenhouse gases. 
because as snow falls on the Greenland ice sheet on the top, and gradually they're compacted to ice, we trap the air of the atmosphere in the snowpack. So when we have the ice, we see a lot of small bubbles in the ice, and these bubbles actually contain air from the past atmosphere. So when we crunch this ice, we have the atmosphere and we can measure how the content of greenhouse gases has been back in time. How many people have breathed the air when Jesus was born? That's what we can do. Now here's one of the very famous records published by our Antarctic colleagues. It's a plot of the, the CO2 during the last thousand years. And you can see that the ground level here 280 parts per million, started to change already 250 years ago. And you can see the increase of the CO2 here in our time here. Some point we realized that the CO2 was increasing, and we put um, stations up in remote places to measure it. And the red curve here overlaps beautifully with our ice cores here. Now, that's one thing that always fascinates me. How come it took so long time before we realized that we were changing the concentrations of green greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It was actually quite late in the 60s before this realization really came. So there's a pretty long time here where we were quite unaware of what we were doing. We can do a look, we can take a look at the methane and we can see the same story. Also very strongly increasing values of methane. So, of course, when we have the long ice cores, and especially if we take an ice core from Antarctica that reaches longer back in time, this is the Vostok ice core reaching 400,000 years back in time, we can see that, uh, let's see here, that uh, the CO2 has also changed when we go back in time. CO2 has changed, methane has changed, and temperature has changed too. So, if we try to follow the ice, back in time towards present, this way here. We can see that the climate is characterized with cold glacial periods, warm interglacial, warm interglacials, it's not, it's not really powered here, and uh, glacial periods again. And we can see that the greenhouse gases actually follow this change here. So there's also a natural change of greenhouse gases, but the, the values we have now, see if we can change slides, yeah? we can see that the, the CO2 has passed 400 parts per million. And if you look at the curve here, 400 is somewhere far up here. So you can see that we have not had so high values of the greenhouse gases back in time. So we are really changing the values beyond the natural changes of our climate system. Now I'm going to go more in detail in the ice cores. And you can see when you look at the ice core, besides from the air bubbles, you can really not see much. So what we do is very much uh, being detectives, trying to look at the crime scene and find out how the climate actually changed back in time. One of the things that are very exceptional with ice cores is the very, very high resolution we have in our data. One layer takes up from 20 centimeters to one centimeter as we approach the bottom. So we can actually detect the layers one by one, and one of the things we have done is simply to count 80,000 years going back in time. Seeing the single layers, being able to see the seasons, gave a strong insight in the climate system and, and the tools to detect how rapid climate changes can be. We measure the core in the field, and one of the, the modern ways is that we take a slab of the ice and place it on a heated golden plate here and melt the slab here and pump the water into our laboratories where we measure the ice in very high resolution. When we do that, we can produce our climate curves. And uh, one I'll talk a, a, a lot about here is the one where we measure the stable water isotopes, which is a proxy for the surface temperature. So time is going this way now. So we start 120,000 years before present and creep up towards present here. On this axis is the stable isotopes. When it's the high values, it's warm. And when it's low values, it's cold. So you can see if we start here with our present climate, 
I have a slight problems with this one. There's no light left in it, but I I'll, I'll think I'll just point. You can see we had a, a, a stable climate period of 11,700 years. But when you go down in the long glacial period here, you can see that we've had a lot of very abrupt changes, 25 abrupt changes, and they're, they're all of them characterized with the fact that we have a very abrupt warming and a slow decrease, abrupt warming and a slow decrease. So th this shows that climate was not very stable at this time here. When we measure on our parameters, we can see that this abrupt warming actually changed the climate over Greenland 10 to 16 degrees. That's a lot. How rapid was that? We can tune in on one of the very recent warmings, the abrupt warming here, leading us into our present interglacial period here, and look at the change, the abrupt warming here. We can tune in even more at these periods here, and uh, what we can see is that the, the rapid warming, this is the temperature proxy here, happens over 50 years. So we have a 10 to 16 degree warming over 50 years. I think that's something people are not so aware about, that we can have so rapid changes in our past. When we look at the evidence from all other material we have, for example, the ocean cores here, there's a thing that shows up. Because if you drill an ice core, for example, here, which is in the area where the water from the Hudson Bay flows out, I think you can see this is just the corner of North America. We have uh, Great Britain here and Scandinavia here. If we look at this core here, we can actually see that the cores have red stripes in them. You can see the red stripes on the picture there. This is material that has a very strong... Um, you have a new one for me. Thank you very much has a very strong concentration of red carbonite material, which is found in the Hudson Bay area. So from these cores, we can deduce that there's a be been an enormous flux of icebergs coming out into the ocean at the time where we have the red stripes. It's simply material that's, fr that's hanging in the iceberg as the ice drags over the bed in the Hudson Bay area. As, as the icebergs come out into the ocean, they melt and the red material drizzles out. So if we are close to the Hudson Bay, we find a lot of the red material, and if we follow the icebergs in the ocean current, we get a decreasing concentration of the red layers. So we are pretty sure that these red carbonates are connected to a big flux of icebergs coming out from the Laurentide ice sheet covering North America in the glacial time. Now, isn't that interesting? We see that all these big transitions in the ice cores, these abrupt changes, are connected with big spikes of, of these red carbonite material, ice rifted material. Now, what is really, really interesting is that it turns out that these big fluxes of icebergs come out at the end of the cold period, but before the warming happens. And if I asked you, I think you would have guessed they came after the warming, because why will the icebergs come before the warming? But that's actually what is seen. We see the icebergs come in the cold period. What do we see more? We see that if we compare ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica, here's the one I've been talking about all the time. This is 25,000 years back in time. Here we have the abrupt change to, young, to Bulling Ellerud. We have the Younger Dryas period, and we have the last abrupt change here up to our present interglacial. If we compare that with a similar record from Antarctica, the Talos Dome record drilled by the Italians, we see the curve here, so we, it's cold, and then we have a very gradual warming here, and a little bump, and then a gradual warming here. But I'd like you to observe that while it's cold here in Antarctica, we have the warming, no, cold in Greenland here, we have the warming in Antarctica. Again, here in the cold Younger Dryas period here, we have the warming in Antarctica. So clearly there's a mismatch, a phase different between what's happening in Greenland and Antarctica. So it's not warming the same times, it's actually shifted with quite an understandable phase. And this made us introduce the theory that is called the bipolar seesaw, that there's an energy exchange between Antarctica and Greenland. And that's quite a, a strong and, and very um, 
energy-rich exchange of, of temperature. If we look at the records, we can see that it's actually every time we have a warming in an art in Greenland, all these 25 events we have here, we see the small bumps in Antarctica. If we, if we try to test our theory, we can see that if we have a long cold period in Greenland, we have a strong warming in Antarctica. And that's what you can see here, the length of the cold period in Greenland uh, to, against the, the, the warming in Antarctica. So we're quite sure this is actually the, what we are seeing, the exchange of energy between the north and the south. What we believe it is, is the fact that the, the, the ocean circulation, the thermohaline circulation, is changing strength. In warm periods, we have a strong thermohaline circulation, a strong ocean current. And when the current is strong, we know that the north is actually stealing energy from the south. So in that way, we can have, uh, 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 we can have a warming in the north while the, the south stays cold. But during the glacial periods, we know that the ocean circulation stopped, and then the north cannot take the energy anymore. So in that matter, the north is cold, while the south is warming. So we believe the transport of energy is very much related to the ocean circulation. The picture is getting complicated now. We have ice caps that are surging a lot of icebergs out. We have ocean currents that change, and we have the temperature that's changing a lot. So you can see that we, we have built a picture of a very complicated um, event that happens during glacial times where all the components of the climate system are involved. I don't want to confuse you with a lot details more, only to point out that uh, it's been observed that while we, when we have these big abrupt change, these big abrupt warmings, it's, it's, con it's connected with sea level changes of, of up to 20 meters. So it's a lot of ice that surged out from the icebergs and a lot of things that's happening to create 20 meters of sea level rise, also quite abruptly over a scale of 100, 500 years. So we have these very abrupt changes and the, part, the reason I've told you so much about it is, can we get abrupt changes into our future? Can we? I think that's quite fascinating. I think we'll just drop this. So I've tried to take three different uh, um, situations that I think could give abrupt changes into our future. So first of all, if the, the ocean current, the thermohaline circulation changed a lot, we would get this situation where the exchange of energy between the north and the south changed. That could give very abrupt changes. And it's not a global change because it's a total internal thing. It's a, it's a change of the distribution of energy on our Earth. Secondly, a very fascinating thing that we think can happen into our future is that the West Antarctic ice sheet could collapse. Antarctica is divided in a big East Antarctic part and a West Antarctic part. And the, the area here that's colored red and dark red is areas where the bedrock, where the ice is standing on, is under the present sea level. And the bedrock stands down to 1.5 kilometers under the present sea level. So you have a big ice sheet that's standing on a bed that's 1.5 kilometers below the sea level. You know that ice can float on water. But if you pile off enough ice, it will stand on the bottom. So when you start reducing the ice thickness, at some point, the ice is not thick enough, and it will pop up and float on the water. This is what we call a collapse of the Western Arctic ice sheet and can give a pretty um, fast sea level rise um, because the ice disintegrates and collapses. So third of all, I think the fact that we are changing our greenhouse gases so rapidly has quite an abrupt look on this plot here. We don't know how the climate will react when we get into a different regime. So I think we need to take into account that it can lead to abrupt changes in our future too. Whew. That was a lot of science. And that was also the major part of the plots I'm going to show you today. I just want to show a last slide here that if we go to the very end of our ice core, to the very deepest part of our ice core, 
where the ice is 120,000 years old, we actually find a, a climate period here where the temperatures were significantly warmer than the ones we have at present over here. This is ice from the previous interglacial, the last interglacial, also named the Emian. And we have investigated this climate period in our ice core from Neem, and we find, and I think I have it on the next slide, sometime here, we find that in this climate period here, temperatures were five degrees warmer than the, the, the present. We also see that the, the ice thickness reduced with 400 meters in Greenland. 400 meters is actually not very much when we talk about a uh, climate change of five degrees. So we can see, we can say that Greenland only reduced its volume with at most 25% during the Amian, thereby giving a rise a sea level of two meters at most. But the interesting thing is that we actually know, whoops, we actually know that we had a sea level rise of six to nine meters during this climate period, the Amian 120,000 years ago. And we know that um, from d dead coral reefs here in Australia that now have placed these six, nine meters over the present sea level. And of course, at the time they were alive, they have been covered with water. So where do the rest come from? That's a question I'll come back to in a moment. I'll end this talk with a few slides about the projections into the future. And these plots are taken from the recent uh, IPCC report that came out last year. You can see the sea level rise we have here. This is the three millimeters per year we have at present. And when we look at the, the three millimeters per year as global sea level rise, we can also realize that uh, sea level rise is not global either. This is a plot of the regional sea level rises in the period where we've had uh, satellite observations. And while it's three millimeters per year in average, it's quite clear that if we take the South Pacific over here, we actually have sea level rises of 10 millimeters per year here. And there's other places where it's actually negative over here. So sea level is not very equally distributed. And just like temperature, to talk about a global sea level rise is not quite relevant for all places. Regional sea levels makes a lot more sense. But if you look at the three millimeters per year in average, the thermal expansion of the water is the strongest and biggest component. When the water gets warmer, it expands. And you can see that the Greenland and Antarctica are still very small because they're averaging over quite a long period here. But if you look at the projections into the future, we get sea level rises up to one meter per year, and it will be the big ice sheets Greenland and Antarctica that will be the main providers of the sea level rise when we get to year 2100. The different projections depend a lot about the scenarios that are used. And I've just tried to give an overview here. So the, the, the predictions reach from 20, 26 centimeters to 82 centimeters here. Uh, but with the error bars, we get up to 1.2 meters here. I think that uh, the collapse of the green ice of the Antarctic ice sheet of West Antarctica is probably the most important message I want to give to you. Just last week, there were two quite significant papers that came out about this. Both of them warn that we already see elevation changes of West Antarctica that will lead to an irreversible retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet. They also try to predict by modeling how long time it will take for this retreat to happen. And uh, their abrupt collapse is a thing that will take 300 to 900 years. So that's also a message to you that when you talk about ice sheets that normally don't move faster than a snail, then abrupt is also something that often could be longer than a few years. 300 to 900 years. But it's still three and a half meters of sea level rise we're talking on, on top of the other components. When we talk about climate, we're often, we are not, we are climate believers. We are not climate scientists anymore. And uh, we join the political debate. 
Well, this is quite uh, fascinating, and of course it's very privileged to do research that is so interesting for everyone. It's also something that can create um, quite an interesting debate from time to time. I want to end this talk bringing you back to the ice and ending our project. Because finishing the project at Neem, we decided we really liked the dome we had built and we wanted to move it with us. So we decided we would try to construct a big, big bicycle ring and uh, place skis under the ring so we could move the dome with us to our next drill site. So here you can see we actually realized the idea. You can see the legs, the 16, one of the 16 legs that the dome is standing on with a wooden plate. So we mounted the ring with, I think, 800 volts around the legs, and we put the wires in here and mounted the plates for the skis here and here at the other side of the dome. The skis came to camp, as you can see there. They're pretty big. And uh, we slided them down the trench to the, under the dome and uh, mounted them on the dome. And then the big day came if we actually could move the dome on the skis. The movie is not so fast, but very soon you'll be able to see that the, the, the vehicles are moving. You can see we actually managed to pull the dome up the hole where it was standing after it's been snowing around the dome for the five years the projects had taken. So here you can see the great day. Dome comes up from its hole, and we are ready to plan for a new project in the years to come. Just let the dome continue. Dome weighs 70 tons, and it's 14 meters high. So it's quite a big thing to move on skis on the ice. Cameraman got a little worried. But as you see the movie, you can also see he and the camera survived. So how's that? It's not a bad research field. So here we are with a big dome on skis on the surface. And uh, we have planned that the next place we would like to drill an ice core, starting 2016, is in northeast Greenland here, where there's a very big ice stream. This is the velocity field, so this is areas with high velocities here. So we want to drill an ice core down through the ice stream because we find that knowledge on ice streams and how they flow will be very important in our ability to model the ice sheets and predict what will happen with sea level rise into our future. So with these words, I'd like to bring my last message here that I've shown to you that climate has always changed. There's been a lot of very big and abrupt changes in our past, but many of the changes we have now are caused by our human uh, pollution, our, the, the increase of concentration of greenhouse gases. And as human beings, it does not seem too wise to change climate faster than we can adapt. And I think that's the right stand to take to climate change, that uh, as we create it, we should be able to control it, and we should not change it faster than we can react. So that's my last slide. And I'll s show this slide at the end, because I also want to thank, thank our American colleagues, the National Science Foundation, that are big partners in our project, and own this fleet of Hercules that are equipped with skis that we use for our research on the green ice sheet. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Dorte. That was absolutely fascinating. If you take a chair here, we'll um, start our conversation. And um, please do um, prepare your comments, or particularly questions, to, to Dorte, uh, which we will have ample time for. We have 35 minutes or so in a discussion. And I would like to start in parts where you ended, Dorte. You were showing the next step in your science, drilling into the ice streams. And um, last time we, we met was, in fact, uh, along the Jakobshaven ice stream and uh, showing, I mean, it was such an incredibly strong um, experience to see the retreat of the ice stream. And you now explain the data here that has gone from 7 kilometers per year to 17 kilometers per year. And what would you say in terms of the projections to the future? Do you foresee 
the, the ice streams to continue retreating at this accelerated speed, or do you see any tendency of, of, of a slowdown? Well, some of, the ice streams, some of the ice streams around Greenland, for example, the Helmheim uh, ice stream on, the, north, uh, on the, the southwest coast, we have observed it has increased velocity and decreased velocity again. So we know that uh, uh, they can change quite uh, both up and down. But the Greenland ice sheet, or the, um, the Jakobshavn ice stream, has a very strong uh, channel beneath, uh, beneath the ice stream. And uh, new radio echo data from the University of Kansas show that this, uh, this channel is actually 1.6 uh, kilometers deep and uh, that the channel actually continues more than 100 kilometers in under the green ice sheet. As, as the, the, ice, the ice has a channel to move in and it's so deep, I think the Jakobshavn ice stream will actually continue to stream for many years and I, I would kind of scale it to, to at mm. least 100 years. And at the same time, the conclusion from the NIM research is that uh, based on your observations from the Emian uh, retreat of the Greenland ice sheet, that in fact it didn't lose more than 400 meters of, of, of level of ice, that your conclusion being that Greenland is probably more resilient than we previously thought. Would you say that uh, despite this retreat in, in ice streams, that could not put in question your conclusion that Greenland in fact may be maybe more resilient than we previously thought. Yeah, here we are standing at present and we have a strong acceleration of the loss of green ice sheet. And then we stand here at the other end and say, ah, it didn't change too much. So we have to get these two ends to meet. And I, I think the, the, the answer to this uh, question or the, the ability to meet is that uh, as the green ice sheet reduces its size and uh, the margins shrink towards the middle, uh, then, of course, because the, the load of the ice is less, the underground will start to lift. And at some point, the ice will simply lose its uh, connection to the ocean. Uh, the, there will be no more channels that the ice can flow out into the, the water again. Because we can see what's really special with the ice streams is that they all end on fjords in the water. So ice streams need to end in the water to be able to move fast. And if you m remove that ability, then the ice streaming must stop which means that more than half the mass loss that we have at present, the, the whole process of ice streams will stop and, and we will suddenly go into a, a, another gear. The Greenland ice sheet will only lose mass by melting along the margins. So I think that's the explanation that we're accelerating now and then there will come a point where it turns and we get mm. into a slower mode as we go towards uh, you know, what we call steady state, where the ice has had long enough time to uh, ca uh, calibrate to a changed climate condition. Okay, okay. I'd like to continue on that thread, but it just reminds me one thing that I um, didn't understand in full was you mentioned that when you look at the paleoclimatic record that the icebergs were released at the cold period before the warming, and, and you kind of asked us, uh, wouldn't you expect it to occur after the warming? So what is the explanation why icebergs are released already at the cold phase before the warming starts. Do we understand that dynamics? Well, I, well I'd say that's probably the, 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 the part we've understood less. And uh, there's been a tendency for, for the different research groups to say, ah, it's the atmosphere, oh, it's the ice, it's the ocean currents, uh, to push it to the other regimes of the climate system. Um, I think it's, it's very well established that we have this release of icebergs and the search during the very cold period. Um, when we look at our data, and that was actually a few slides that I jumped pretty fast because I thought it was getting a little too detailed, um, we can see that uh, before we see the abrupt warming happening in Greenland, we actually see that the, the load of dust we see in the ice core changes. And how do we get dust to the Greenland ice sheet? Dust actually comes uh, uh, from, from the subtropical area, from the China loss area, uh, which is the monsoon area. Um, so um, when, when it's dry in the area, the loss area in China, uh, the dust can blow to the green ice sheet. But when it gets wet, when the monsoon covers the area with lush, then it doesn't lift into the atmosphere, and we get a very reduced amount of impurities to the ice. So the fact that we see the change of the dust load first actually indicates that there's been a change of the monsoon belt in the subtropicals. So we believe that the big abrupt change in the north is actually pushed uh, by, by the changing monsoon um, in, the, in, the, in the equator area. 
okay, now I, I know you will blame me and say, okay, now she just pushed it to another regime again. That wasn't really explanation, was it? But I, I'm not so sure I can push it further than that, other than say that uh, as it becomes cold in the north, the, the south is actually warming, and the fact that the south is warming can actually be the, the, the thing that pushes the monsoon belt, and, and I think that's how it happens. Mm. So you, you, we have these very abrupt changes in the north, but they are kind of in a, a kind of a harmonic uh, movement with the south that just has the softer movements here, and the warming in the south actually moves the monsoon belt that clicks it and makes a big change in the north. So when your paper came out uh, with, with all the international colleagues uh, presenting the final results on, on, the, on the NIM uh, core drilling project, you, you, you really, um, apart from such a fascinating piece of science, you generated quite a lot of scientific nervousness around the world, uh, given the point that you made here, that the conclusion being that Greenland therefore could not contribute with more than two meters sea level rise, but we know with quite good robust evidence that the sea level was in fact six to nine meters higher. So where is the, the, the lacking four to, four to seven meters? And, and then that is then accentuated by the science that has just come out showing that we may have come to a point of irreversible melt in Antarctica, which I think many of us perceived as, as being the more resilient of the two poles. So when you combine all these insights, it's kind of approaching a point of the scientist's nightmare, as, as it were. And, and, and what's your conclusion here? Do you, do you find it to be uh, still an area of, um, let's say, at the cutting edge of, of, of knowledge gaps? Or are you quite confident that, in fact, the answer is in Antarctica rather in the Arctic when it comes to the large sea level rises we've seen in, 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 the, in the history of Earth? Well, when you're talking about a, a sea level rise of six to nine meters um, during the warm Amian period 120,000 years ago, um, you, can, you, you can compare it with the volume of the green ice sheet, which uh, would give a rise to seven meters of sea level rise if it all melted away. Just the fact that all the cores we've drilled in Greenland contains um, ice from the Amian climate period near the bottom shows that the green ice sheet cannot have reduced very much. So. Mm. The new results showing that it only lost uh, two meters confirm idea we've had for many years that the, the Greenland ice sheet is more resilient than believed by many researchers. And I think it, it's actually a, a big success from our research that we've managed to move the whole society towards the, the idea that Greenland is not uh, um, reducing its mass so much in the, in the EMEAN 120,000 years ago. If Greenland is not there, it simply has to be an Antarctica. Uh, because there's no other sources of sea level rise you can imagine. Thermal warming of the ocean waters can at most give something of the scale of half a meter. And if you took all the rest of the ice in our world, everything, um, the Iceland ice cap, uh, the Alps, the Norwegian, the Alaskan ice, the Patagonian ice, everything we have, and melt it away, it will probably not give more sea level rise than 0 0.4 meters. 40 centimeters. So there simply is nothing. It has to be Greenland or Antarctica. Mm. So I think it's pretty clear it has to be Antarctica now. But I'm a person that believes in data, and I think it would be one of the most important research goals in the coming time is to prove that there was a, a, a surge, a collapse of the, somewhere in Antarctica uh, during this period. If you look at the longer records we have from the ocean, especially from the Andrill program, we s we w there is very, very strong evidence that Western Antarctica has surged or collapsed uh, when we go back in time. We just don't have an ocean core that uh, shows uh, the, the needed evidence from the Amian period that there was a collapse 120,000 years ago. Now, ocean cores is not my core speciality, but as far as I know, there has never been a core that has sufficient data from this climate period to prove it if it was there or not. So that would be fantastic to have it. We had really, really great hopes uh, that it would be solved by the Western Arctic ice sheet that uh, our American colleagues drilled. Unfortunately, it turned out that there's very, very strong basal melt at the site they have drilled. So it's not possible from their ice core to deduce if the ice sheet was gone during the Amian, 
or it's just a strong basal melt from the energy from the ground that has removed the old ice. But none of the cores that we find in the Western Arctic ice um, sheet area that reaches bedrock does contain ice from the Eemian period. So, so at least that's a hint that it's not there. Hmm. I, I'm kind of tempted not to continue drilling into the global risks we're facing, but I have one, one more question in, in this regard. I mean, some critical voices will say that, well, okay, uh, your conclusion is from, from the data you're finding that Greenland probably is more resilient than we previously thought, but it's based on observations from the Eemian. But in the Eemian, we weren't burning fossil fuels at the scale that we are today, clearly. And it's not only greenhouse gases, but it's also black carbon. And black carbon is, is creating a much darker surface in our polar regions. Uh, couldn't it be so that Greenland, due to this change in surface color, in fact, today in the Anthropocene, is more sensitive than it was 130,000 years back? Uh, and what are your reflections on, on that added salt in, in, the, in the scar, as it were? Yeah. Um. Black carbon is very important, uh, especially in the atmosphere. It has an enormous impact on, on how our climate changes. But it, it's, uh, it's actually fascinated me a lot that it's kind of become a, a belief by being repeated and repeated and repeated that black carbon has a big effect uh, on, on the behavior of the green ice sheet. And now, when we drill an ice core in Greenland, we also measure the concentration of black carbon in the ice cores. We can see if we go back uh, 50 years, we can see we had a very high concentration, three times um, the, 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 the pre-industrial background value of black carbon. But as we go towards the present, we've actually managed to clean our air a lot. So we've seen the levels of, of black carbon have actually nearly reduced to the pre-industrial values. So actually, if you compare the Amian with the present, we probably had the same values mm. of uh, black carbon in the Amian and now. Now, um, I'm not saying that black carbon doesn't have um, any influence everywhere. I know from results from Svalbard and from glaciers in, in, in India, in Himalaya, where, where there's a lot of, of uh, burning, food is made over open fires, that there's higher concentrations of black carbon, and it's quite clear it's observed on the surfaces of the glaciers. I just think in Greenland, we've never really had strong evidence that the black carbon is changing um, the, the ba energy balance on the surface of the ice sheet. Can I mention the 2012 event? Please do. The okay, Albedo. thank you. Yeah. We had, in 2012, um, there was a very special event because uh, we had the uh, rain and melt over the whole Greenland ice sheet. And that's really, really uncommon. I've never experienced it before. We were in our name camp at that time. So I was standing in the name camp that day, the 12th of July, 2012. So it rained on the surface, even in the center of the green and ice sheet. And we had a rainbow, which we've never seen before in the camp. So um, at this time, um, we saw that the whole surface became shobby, shaggy, you know, wet, splashy. And the water sits, uh, wet down in the snowpack and refroze as the ice layer deeper down. But the, the structure change of the surface made the surface very dark. And that, of course, changes you know, the ability of energy to seep into the surface and enhance the melt. I think these things are much more important to the behavior of the ice sheet uh, than, than a black carbon concentration. Um, so I don't think, I would, my, my hint is that the black carbon is not having a strong effect on what's happening on the green and ice sheet at present. Well, this is fascinating, and as you've probably seen, um, Jason Box and, and colleagues at the Bard Institute calculated that just those two weeks of, of albedo change during that July period corresponded to an energy injection of in the order of 300 exajoules of, of heat. Mm. And the annual consumption of energy in the world is 600 exajoules, and yeah. the U.S. uses 200 exajoules. So temporarily, in fact, Denmark bypassed China and the U.S. as the largest climate-forcing nation on Earth. <laughs> yeah. Temporarily. Yeah. So, so, of course, when, when Mother Nature changes her feedbacks, uh, things happen at, at a very big, grand scale. I have one more question before opening the floor. And I, be, before you gave your talk, we, we discussed a bit about the, the, the risks of abrupt changes. And I find it absolutely fascinating, your point, that we've seen very abrupt changes over short time periods, over 
50 year time slots, 10 to 16 degrees variability. And, and your comment was also that we're quite poor at, at addressing these risks and incorporating the risk of abrupt changes in our assessments, like in the IPCC and other assessments, and also certainly in the policy domain. Um, how, how, could we, how could we increase our understanding of abrupt changes in, 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 into policy? And how, how should we deal with this, the bridge between, because normally already just the risk of, of incremental change is difficult to get properly addressed among policymakers. And here you're flagging that we need to understand uh, the risk of, of abrupt shifts that can occur, which would then affect the economy and social systems across the world. So what is, what's your reflection on um, how, how to deal with risk of abrupt changes in, in, in policy? Well, we've worked a lot with it uh, in the, the FP7 European Union program, Past for Future. And uh, I think that the first thing we've done is, is try to map uh, the abrupt changes in warm climate periods, uh, like uh, the, the Little Ice Age and uh, the, the medieval warming and, and other uh, abrupt events we can find in, in the interglacial period and try to understand the global distribution of these events, because we, we do need a better understanding of the abrupt events and also globally uh, mm. before we can really understand them enough to predict what happens. Mm. But I think just like uh, you work with um, a risk of, of extreme events like storms and uh, flooding, uh, you can also work with um, uh, you know, risk uh, components of, uh, of abrupt events in the climate system. So you need to scale them and, and put a, a risk on them. They have, some can be very big and very unlikely, but they're worth taking into account because they are so impact giving if they happen. And that way you, you could be able to access the risk for such events uh, in, in top of, of having the climate projections, which are more smooth and not really taking abrupt events into account. Mm. I, I know that was not uh, you know, a, a, a roadmap, how to do it, but I think uh, it can be done, at least mm. to some degree. Yeah. And I think what, what you're indirectly flagging right through as a red thread through your talk is that we need to be able to think in longer time periods in terms of how we are stewards of, of the climate system. So, floor is open. There is a mic over there. There's also a rotating mic is, if needed. Please do uh, um, state your name and uh, preferably pose a question. If you have a comment, keep, keep it short. And uh, yes, please. Uh, may I start? Yes, yes, please. Stan Karpinski from Warsaw University of Life Sciences. Uh, really very impressive talk. However, it's always a however. Uh, I'm going to say like this. The geologist saying that giving us 50 years that the desert area increase up to 10% because of global warming. Atmospheric sciences, scientists saying within 30 years, we will approach 450 ppm of CO2, which it is going to be inevitable. We are not going to change this destination. And my question is, we know already the diagnose. It doesn't matter for me if I'm going to die from explosion of the super volcano in Yellowstone or from flood of three and a half meters, yes, or something else, or cosmic catastrophe. Do we need to spend all this money, trillions of euro, to know our destination instead of spending, for example, for inventing teleportation machine and teleport an another planet? Because we, we, this is inevitable. Yes, mm -hmm. within 50 years, or you are saying 300 years, yes, we are facing a really catastrophe. We are not going to revert this. We are not able to revert as a civilization. Or maybe you believe we are able to revert. I think we can reduce at least. I do agree that uh, we'll never avoid um, a, to, to have a lot of adaption in our future. I don't believe uh, we will be able to, to revert it in any way. But I think there is a difference of, of having a catastrophe and Yellowstone exploding and having a global climate change that is man-made. Uh, because if we make it as men, we can also um, control it as men and women, of course. Um, so, so in that way, I don't think it's very intelligent to make bigger changes than we can control. But again, I think your comment about your, you, you will die, so who cares, is, is exactly 
something I'll jump on, because I think we have a strong responsibility to our next generations. And it's a thing that's been said many times in the climate debates. <laughs> Can you look into your grandchildren's eyes and, uh, and when they tell you that, how could you do it? You knew you were doing, how could you do it? Okay, you'll have to take that discussion afterwards if you want to follow that up. No, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think we're going to die because the climate changes. Because I think we, we, we if we help each other and uh, and do the adaption and do the, the intelligent way of energy, I think we, we can have quite a happy life into the future. I just think it's high time that it's really addressed and, and taken seriously. And, and that's what I think is the difference between Yellowstone exploding and, and the greenhouse gases. The one is human made, one is out of our control. So we have a question right here. My name is Nikola Karavosilev. I am from the University of Sofia, Bulgaria. Well, I would like to ask you the following question. So uh, you said that the increase of the carbon dioxide emission, uh, it, is, uh, it correlates with the rise of the temperatures on our planet. Uh, but on your diagrams, we saw that uh, in the past, much before the Industrial Revolution, there was several periods of such um, of, uh, of increasing of the carbon dioxide. Well, how can you explain them? For example, I remember that on one of your diagrams, you showed that approximately 150,000 years ago, there was such a period of high temperatures and high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What was the reason for this? Well. Uh, we, we can see that over many glacial and interglacial cycles, that the, the CO2, for example, changes from, from, from the, 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 the glacial values of about 180 parts per million uh, to, to, the, um, to, to the warm climate period, the value of around 280 parts per million. So it's a, a change of about 100 parts per, per million there is between the natural cold and warm periods in our climate system. It's normally believed uh, that, uh, that the, 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 the cycle itself is uh, externally forced by, by the, the position of, the, of, the, of our Earth in, in its orbit around the Sun. So it's changing energy, especially on the North Hemisphere in the summer, that, that starts the cycle as so. But uh, calculations have also showed that we would not get as big a warming we, as we have on our Earth, the difference between glacial and interglacial temperatures. If, if the increasing CO2 did not help to enhance it. So the last thing I want to answer is where does it come from? By far most of the CO2 we have is in the oceans. And when we change the temperature of the oceans, uh, we release CO2. If we, for example, warm the ocean, we release CO2 to the atmosphere because the ocean can't hold so much CO2. So, so that's where it comes from. So it is natural when the Earth gets warmer, we get more CO2 in the atmosphere. But the values we have now uh, do, not, uh, do not agree with the temperatures we have now. The CO2 are much, much higher, and it's quite easy for us to calculate where it comes from just by looking at our chimneys. So we have a, a Earth now that's far out of balance. We have much more greenhouse, higher concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere than our, our temperatures on the surface indicate. And any school class um, could make an experiment where they put greenhouse glasses in a, in a glass and show that it will increase the temperatures when the energy from the sun comes through it. So it's known science that higher values of CO2 in the atmosphere will, will, will warm uh, the, the surface of the Earth. So we're just, we're just in a game where it takes uh, from, from 100 to 1,000 years for the climate system to react to a new system. Energy has to seep down into the ocean and warm the ocean. And, and the ice sheets have a very long time scale of reacting too. Um, so so we, are, we cannot expect that the temperature on the Earth comes in balance with the greenhouse gases immediately. I hope that answered at least part of your questions. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Yep, so we have a question just next to uh, 
the previous speaker. My name is Tihomir Stefano from the National Natural History Museum in Sofia, Bulgaria. I have a question. Do you expect in a short term period if uh, the tendency of the Jakobs have uh, stream uh, is skipped, do you expect uh, it will change the um, ocean streams, uh, the closest one, the biggest closest one is Gulf Stream. Do you expect that it could make a kind of change of the Gulf Stream, for example, all this flow of uh, fresh water in, into the, from, from Greenland uh, ice into the Atlantic Ocean? Well, I, I don't think the, 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 the ice discharge from the Jakobshavn ice stream in itself uh, will change the, the, the Gulf Stream because if you, even though it's a lot of ice coming out from the Green Ice Sheet, um, the, the freshwater um, um, influx to, to the Arctic area has many components and, and the fresh water from the rain falling over Russia um, is by far the, the biggest source of freshwater supply to the Arctic uh, area. So I think the, the Jakobshavn ice stream is too small a component uh, in the fresh water um, balance uh, to change the system. But if the Gulf Stream will change or not, is something that, that is, is, is something um, I could not answer as, as, as precise as that. Because uh, at, I don't know if you all remember, about 10 years ago, there was quite a, uh, a notice that uh, the Gulf Stream was seen to observe, to, to, to reduce its uh, currency. But then when it was measured over a longer time period, it showed out just to be noise and, and, and variance in, in the Gulf Stream uh, velocities. So at present, we, we do not see a, a decrease in the, in, the, in, the, in the currents of the Gulf Stream. But it could happen if, if the freshwater um, um, supply to the Arctic increased. And uh, at the moment, there are enormous knowledge gaps in knowledge of how much fresh water is being supplied, especially um, from Russia, because so many of the measuring stations are out of order right now. So that's a, that would be a high scientific wish uh, to, to have better observational stations of the, the fresh water coming out of the rivers uh, from Russia mm. into, the, into the basin. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have a few questions. So. If you want to come in, please, please raise your hands. I have one question here, Dorte, which is, um, so several questions here have, have related to our ability to adapt. And I think if you read through um, working group two of, of the fifth assessment, uh, I mean, I, I misrepresented slightly, but I think you could at large say that the evidence seems to suggest that up to two degrees, we in fact have a very high chance of being able to adapt, but beyond two degrees, we, for one, may start triggering the kind of abrupt self-accelerating feedbacks and, and, and abrupt changes that you've been flagging, but also we enter a, a realm where adaptation is not obvious because we might be undermining many of our life support systems. So do you believe that we can um, stay below two degrees? Well, if we look at, at, the, at uh, the present behavior, and uh, as time is running towards 2100, I would say no. I, I don't believe that we will reach the two degree limit. I think we will get a, a greater global uh, temperature change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd also like to point out uh, uh, that the five degrees warming that we saw over Greenland during the Amian 120,000 years ago, five degrees warmer in the Arctic area is actually, actually equivalent to about two and, or two and a half degrees global warming. So already within the next 100 years, we will reach the same temperatures over Greenland that we had in the Amian. But again, the Greenland ice sheet takes long time to react. So it's not that we just need the warming to have the same situation as we had after 5,000 years of warm climate during the Amian. Mm. So I think we will get uh, warming. And uh, I think we will cope with it. I'm, I'm not a pessimist. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried, I would say. I just. I'm a goer, I think we should act on it and, and, and uh, work on it. And my biggest hope is we can convince a lot of, of young, bright researchers to, to, to choose the field of climate science and energy um, development, because we can certainly do it, but we need to help each other and we need to take a responsibility uh, for areas that are poor and cannot uh, do the adaptation um, themselves. That is actually a very good 
kind of note to end on, but I, I won't. I won't really allow it because I want to. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't want to allow you to escape from from one one more question, which is I think hanging a bit in the air, which is. My 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 14 year old daughter gave me a bit of a punch in the stomach uh, a few weeks back because she said, you know, Dad, if if I want to have kids when I'm uh, around 30, my kids will be alive in 2100. Actually, they will be adults, a bit in, in in our age, so to say. And and that is a reminder that 2100, which we normally always perceive as being the end of our projections, is really not so far away. And you showed it yourself that. I mean, the projections currently is a four-degree world, on average, without even considering the kind of abrupt changes that you've presented here already by 2100, which is, you know, exactly in our grandchild's living era. And so, and then you present all these data on, um, on, on, on the risks of sea level rise. I mean, the IPCC projects at least one meter. If the West Antarctic ice sheet has now passed an irreversible threshold, we have another meter, that's two meters. So what would be your, with your current assessment of the knowledge, what would be your best guess on average sea level rise by 2100? Well... And everyone <laughs> is prepared on their Twitters here, so... Um. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's uh, important to have a high level, perhaps with a low probability, but put the high level high enough that you're sure that that you with good confidence can say that when you really reach that year, then sea level hasn't exceeded that. And I would say you would put to the upper level at, at 1.5, perhaps not two meters, but 1.5, I think it's reasonable to see as, as the upper level. I think in, in the Netherlands, uh, I think, uh, isn't it two meters that uh, they're preparing for? Mm -hmm. I think they're very wise. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. Um, Paul Burke, who is the, the head of uh, Nestle, told me once that um, his, his definition of a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. <laughs> and um, it seems to me that you are a very well-informed optimist and, and you don't even turn into a pessimist. So, so Dorta, I think this is uh, incredibly inspiring, not only the enormous value of the glaciology that you are and have pursued and will continue to pursue, but also your approach to seeing the possibilities of our human ingenuity to actually adapt and, and, and navigate a, a very risky, in fact, uh, future. So with that, I think we all owe you another clap for a very good talk and a very good set of, of, of Q&As. So thank you very much, Dorte. <clears throat>